I write every day. I get up around five or so and get two little kids off to school. And then I go to work around nine and work until, oh, four o'clock or so. And then do it pretty much every day. Oh, I wish. No, it doesn't get easier. It gets harder, in fact. Because uh, you, know, you, you can't write the same book, and that would, that's always tempting. Uh, the making of sentences is hard work. The, you, you can't copy your own sentences, and you can't copy those of others, and so you're, search, you know, you're searching for a certain grace and a certain rhythm and melody that's underneath the prose that carries the story. Great question. The, the first answer that pops to my head is absolutism, uh, certainty. Uh, I'm certain about very little in this world, and I distrust those who are. They have a, uh, they have feel the stink or the smell of, of uh, blinders and of, of uh, pomposity and pretentiousness that, for me, accompanies uh, certainty. A little bit of hypocrisy also weaves its way through absolutism. And there's so much of it around us on television, every talk show seems to have it. And in the real world, I'm always encountering people who declare things about the world I live in with a, a certainty that I just don't, don't see around me. And in my writing, uh, that shows. That's why the issue of truth appears so much throughout all, all of my books that I'm skeptical of well, what's declared to be true. I don't think pride is the right word. I look, I look at the book now 20 years after having written it with a, a sense of dissociation. I, I find it hard to believe that those stories are mine and those sentences are mine. And in a way, they aren't any longer. They're part of uh, the world of literature. A book goes out and it, it takes on its own, I don't want to say its own life, but its own uh, aboutness and identity that is divorced from the person who, who made it. And I feel sometimes, even now, a bit like a fraud. That I know I wrote the book, and intellectually I know it, but um, it, to read it, it surprises me at times. A phrase will surprise me, or an event will surprise me, and it, it, it come at me a bit, a, bit, a bit as a stranger's voice does. And in a way, I am a stranger to the person who wrote that book. I'm 20 years older, and I've had 20 years of, of new experiences, of children and things I never had before that make that old voice seem old. No, in, in a way, it's, life has eerily and uncannily echoed that final chapter of the book where the uh, Timmy, that little kid at the end of that book, was a foreigner to the author who wrote the book. It's an effort to, as the story says at the end, to save little Timmy's life. A little boy who grew up in a small cow town in southern Minnesota and found himself uh, entangled in, in Vietnam but not just in Vietnam, in, in hard moral choices that uh, it never had occurred to me I'd ever face in my life. And the little naive Lone Ranger playing Timmy that became that soldier in Vietnam was a kind of stranger to the guy who wrote that book, the, the middle-aged me, <clears throat> just as now the author of the book seems a bit of a stranger. Um, by bit of, I mean, I, I, I'm not talking mysticism. I'm simply saying that, you know, 20 years is a long time to pass. And, and uh, well, when a sense of self changes, I think of myself now primarily as a father and secondarily as a writer. And I've heard those words come out of my mouth 20 years ago. It would have been impossible. Didn't want kids. Didn't think it'd be very much fun. Didn't think it would challenge me. I thought I'd be kind of bored by it, and now that is more my life than, than uh, writing. It's nothing intelligent behind it. That is, it wasn't a rationally planned operation, but rather it's how the world comes at me. 
it comes at me in a mix of my imagination of uh, coming over here to do this interview. I'm imagining who I meet and what it'll be like, and I've never done a video interview before, and what will the physicality of the place be, and all these, and partly the real world. And I think that I'm not all that uncommon in that. I think we all live partly in our daydreams, and daydreams is the wrong word because it makes it sound syrupy and mystically, I mean, but I partly mean daydreams, and I partly mean just thought or anticipation of event that hasn't yet occurred. And I think we all live there, and you certainly live there in a situation such as a war, where you're partly, uh, the reality of the world is in your face, but partly there's the wistful call of girlfriends and home and all the things you don't have but yearn for, where you're living partly in your imagination, I'm not in a war, and you'll flow in and out of these two. The way you would maybe in a cancer ward, or if your marriage is collapsing, or your father has died, or you partly have the stark reality of that corpse in that coffin, and you're partly remembering your dad's face as he threw you a baseball, or, or the, even more poignantly, the in my case, the wish that he were you know, throwing you a baseball, kind of the invented throwing of uh, what wasn't. So the, I, I guess what I'm saying is that I didn't, I, like everything, I don't, I, didn't, I don't and didn't plan in a cerebral way the form of the things they carried. I took advantage of what was natural to me. I mean, intentionally knew what I was doing, but I was taking advantage of what really is pretty natural to me. I live in at least those two worlds of imagination and, and uh, the world we all live in. Well, th through story, essentially. One, you hope is a, when you do what I do, you write novels, you're hoping for, for a, a sense of feeling to come through in the end, that through nonfiction, the brain is engaged and the head is engaged primarily. Not always just that, but primarily. And with fiction, telling invented stories, the hope is that through the story, a reader lying in bed at night or, <clears throat> you know, reading a book on the subway or the bus will sort of leave the bus and leave the bed and be exported to Madame Bovary's bedroom. And you're kind of there, half a witness and half a participant in a story. And my hope is that those who read the things they carry in my other books, too, you hope that they'll feel through that identification thing that happens in a story where you're rooting for people or, you know, hoping the villain is caught or whatever your emotional take on, you're in it and not just observing it the way you observe CNN or you observe the Fox Channel with disgust. I don't think I've ever tried to resolve it. I think it's one of those things that kind of resolves itself. When I speak about Vietnam or when I uh, write about it, I'm not, my, my own uh, selfhood kind of evaporates. I'm interested in what's occurring on the page and I'm interested in what's gonna become of these characters and I'm interested in the moral struggles they're going through. And I don't, I'm not, my, my attention is on the making of, a, of an object in a way, an artifact, the way a sculptor may look at a piece of stone. And you may have a vision for what you want that stone to become, but part of what you do is it's, the stone kind of leads you to what it's going to become. A vein of minerals may run through it and, oh, that's there, that could become this. And that's a bit like writing fiction. A bit of dialogue may pop out of a character's mouth that's unplanned and unintentional on my part. I have no volition over it, it seems to appear. Well, I know that I'm it's coming from somewhere inside my head and my history and my imagination, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel as if I'm willing it. I'm making it happen by volition, it's appearing. Uh, stories have a way of, of pulling you along, kind of chasing the story as you're writing it. And it, it it doesn't feel as if I'm playing that old childhood game of connecting dots that they've all been planned and I'm just gonna write sentences to connect it all. 
it feels more as if I'm on a on a riverboat and watching people and scenery go by. And the novel or story has that feel of a of a voyage in which I'm partly a participant and partly a witness. I wish I could say yes, because it would sound so much big thinky. But it, 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 the, the act of writing for me is largely the act of following sentences, of making sentences. And for most people, that probably is a time to click off, you know, and look at something else. But unfortunately for me, stories grow out of a sentence. For example, the sentence, this is true, began one of my stories. I wrote the sentence, was a, had no idea of what, what was true. True in what sense, I had no idea, and I wrote another sentence to follow that with a buddy in Vietnam named Bob Kiley. Well, the, I'm discovering, I'm, I'm partly discovering and I'm partly just curious about or fascinated about issues of what, what could be true and what is this character going to say is true and does this character really mean it? Does he really mean it's true? And uh, to what degree uh, does this character think it's true? And how could anybody say this is true and without a little tongue-in-cheek action going on? So it's a, it's a discovery. You know, what I think is one of my better stories grew out wholly out of the unplanned, out of a scrap of language. It's forgotten by readers, I think, that are largely forgotten that that there are 26 letters in the alphabet and some punctuation marks, and that's all we've got. And that is what I work with, sitting in my underwear, day after day, year after year, are these 26 letters and these punctuation marks. And out of that, characters come and moral quandaries are explored. But in the end, the work of writing, unfortunately, it was really the battling with A, B, C, D, and that comma that's so incalcitrant. There are those, and it does, it's not a function of age, and it probably isn't even a function entirely of, of uh, education or political leaning, but there's a, there's a temper of, in probably America, but for sure, I know in America, and maybe worldwide for the literal, a literal take on everything that, that reality TV has taken advantage of and incorporated as part of itself. And the, that l the literal take on things is a take without irony and without edge and without, it's usually a fairly s a certitude to it. Why don't you write a book that has nothing to do with war? As if that's a certain possibility, you should certainly try to do it as a way of recovering from the war. And you want to say a number of things. This is not just a book about war, you idiot. And it's a book about love and a book about storytelling. But you also feel overwhelmed by, by the knowledge that you're not going to get through, that the literal-minded are going to remain literal-minded. And maybe someone else can help them, but the, the, someone else is not, is not this guy. So there's a, there's a wave of anger or bitterness it has to do with Vietnam, and has to do with a kind of mindset of the literal all around me that doesn't fit my take on the world It's a, a, in my experience in the world where it's hard for me to take anything very literally. The words, I love you, I have, as soon as they're uttered, I'm suspect. How much? And when will you stop? And will you? Um, in what way do you love me? And what is love to you, by the way? Is it forever or is it till the next, you know, person passes you? All this stuff complicates, uh, whereas someone else would say, well, love is love. And if you don't know what it is, you're really, you're a poor guy. And that's their take. Partly, it's to, uh, partly I try to skewer it, uh, parody it, make fun of it, ridicule it, and put it in its place. But partly I'm, I'm sympathetic to the literal. That is, I'm sympathetic with some mom is holding a dead kid in her arms, and how else is she to take it? But here's my dead child. And so there's a part of me that understands it and is sympathetic to it. 
and probably the better part of me is that way, where I have at least at least some capacity to, uh, I think, which novelists kind of have to have to imagine otherness outside oneself. And as a consequence, my books are filled with characters who bear no resemblance to me, and and who can be villainous in, in ways I'm not villainous, and can be good in ways I'm not good. That uh, I think the capacity for for empathy or understanding goes with a successful book because you have to create other characters and other angles of vision on material for the for a book to ring with, ring with some kind of authenticity. Among my fellow soldiers in Vietnam, I mean, there was and remains to this day a kind of absence of that kind of empathy. A, a dead child is a dead gook, and a dead Vietnamese woman, or one with her legs blown off is a woman, a gook with her legs blown off. And it pretty much remains that way these days. Forty years later, these same buddies I served with in Vietnam don't have much empathy for the uh, so-called enemy. And I doubt they would be capable of because because that's there of you know writing the things they carried, they'd write another book. It would be a it would be a much different book. I ran into a kid in Seattle, a kid, twenty six year old, um, at a book at a book signing, and I saw him out of the corner of my eye, standing in the corner, and was kind of frightened by him, not in physically, but I mean, oh God, I hope it's not a manuscript he's got to give me and that, which is hell, of course. To... And the guy, the, finally the reading ended and he hung around and I could feel him out of the corner of my eye approach me and he had me sign his book and I did. And he began to leave and then he turned around and he said, I think you knew my father. And as soon as he said those words, uh, I knew who the kid was. I saw it in his face. You could see his dad in that kid's face. It was my platoon leader in Vietnam. Uh, and he told me over the course of the next, I don't know, 20 minutes or half hour that he, had, the kid, had been searching for his father ever since. His father had committed suicide soon after Vietnam and uh, had looked for his dad in very brave, cool ways. He had joined the army just to see what his father had gone through. He'd become a Green Beret to see what his dad had been, and a ranger, all this tough, snake-eating, you know, stuff. And he had picked up my first book and his father figures in the book, not in always in the most laudatory ways. In fact, not in laudatory ways. Well, that encounter, I mean, makes me want to cry. If I weren't on camera, I'd be a little tears in my eyes now. Because it's an example of why I began writing in the first place. I wanted to touch people in, in a way that, that stories can touch them. And I had helped in a very modest way for this fellow to fill in a gap of who this man had been who had committed suicide before they even knew his father. His father had killed himself when he was very, I think he was like six months old or eight months, very young. Um, encounters like that remind me of why I began. It's easy to forget why you, why you become a writer. And letters I'll get from the girlfriends of people in Iraq or Afghanistan or the children which all say the same thing, basically. I don't know my dad, and he won't talk about it, or my mom in some cases, but largely men. And we, I read your book, and now I know at least something of what he's carrying around with him, and what he won't talk about, and sometimes the book will be shared with the veteran. And conversation will ensue, and that, is way beyond anything I intended in the writing of the book. I didn't intend to bring people together or start them talking. But it shows you the power of, of literature. It, can, it really touches individual people, real lives, and the real world, and 
contributes to their lives. It does something to their lives. Uh, that That's what I dreamed of when I began writing. I dreamed of touching some 15-year-old kid in Dubuque or some grieving mother in you know, Harlem. Literature makes you feel, if it's any good, it can make you feel a little less alone in the world. Someone else has gone through this, and it gives you some late night company um, with your memories and your sorrow. Literature is, does touch people. It's not just to be read in English classes. You can't physically tr put a person, I mean, I've, I've often thought of what a cool movie it would be, for example, if you go to a war movie and they out of the screen come real bullets and you're ducking and you get a, that where it's not, you're not shielded by the, the knowledge that I'm not going to die in this movie house or, or at least the bullets aren't going to do it. Um, and you can't do that, that, that you rely, as you probably do in anything, you're relying on, on the human, uh, the reader or the audience's imagination to, to sort of suspend the knowledge that I'm not going to die inside this book or at this movie. But you, you almost try to seduce the reader or the audience into almost forgetting that, almost forgetting that, a feel of danger. And, and a, a good work of art, there's a movie called The Messenger that's recently come out about the, with Woody Harrelson and Ben Foster. It's a, and it's, not, it's a war movie in a way, although none of it happens in war. It's the notification of next of kin, where they knock on doors and say your son's dead or your husband's gone. And although you know in the theater it's not, it's, you know, there are actors and so on, there's a bluntness and a brutality and a horror to it that, that some of it was way beyond John Wayne stuff and the actual war stuff, which has a, you kind of expect what's coming. It's a war, people are going to die, and you harden yourself to it, and they do. It's a different experience to watch those knuckles on the door and that fate door open and if that face, that person die in front of you, that mother. Um, that... That is um, what art is for. That's what it's for. It's for cutting through rhetoric and cutting through politics and cutting through convention to uh, open a trap door in your soul. <laughs> the avowed purposes behind our, our preemptive war and Iraq, or let's get rid of weapons of mass destruction. I think I'm pretty clear on my memory on that. Well, there weren't any. And uh, it's a bit like, let's go to war because we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, except Pearl Harbor hadn't happened. And I'm astonished that it lar seems largely forgotten. It seems are erased from the public discourse about the war. I don't hear many people going on television saying that we went to war for reasons that didn't exist. And I don't, I don't feel any outrage coming from anybody. I, and I don't, not only do I not feel it now, I never felt it. Um, I find that stunning. And what I do hear instead is, well, we, we got rid of a tyrant, Saddam Hussein. The problem with that is, is that in the first place, that wasn't the reason we went to war. They, you know, Powell didn't go before the United Nations saying, let's get rid of a tyrant. He went before saying there are weapons of mass destruction. And there was no tyranny stuff there, except in the most secondhand and trivialized kind of way. More, but beyond that, you know, there's a thing called consistency, and there's another thing called hypocrisy. And if the object is to get rid of tyrants around the world, why aren't we nuking Red China, what we used to, what the Republicans used to call Red China, and why aren't we at war with half the countries in Latin America, and why aren't we attacking half the countries in Africa, if not more than half? Um, there, and there are no answers to those questions. Sort of cherry pick your war and go get rid of that tyrant. And then there's the question of ty tyrant in whose eyes. I mean, and, and what if, for example, Al Qaeda were to declare uh, George Bush 
is a tyrant and we're going to attack you. Are we all going to say, okay, come attack us. It's okay to attack tyrants. Who declares who the tyrant is? Are we, are, are we, have we been elected as a country to decide who the tyrants are and who the good guys are? Um, those are complicated questions and they're not addressed. They're not even looked at anymore. And uh, it, it, that's part of where my frustration comes, I think, in uh, writing about this subject, is I feel that things have been de-elevated and that the discourse is aimed at a really low, low, low place. And difficult questions are not just not answered, they're not even asked. And they aren't asked by, or don't seem to have been asked by the people who are uttering uh, the bellicose rhetoric of war. They seem to be elided and evaded. Um, and then there's the final issue that kind of attends your question, which is the issue of of personal, I don't know how to phrase this, uh, but a, per, a personal commitment to one's own rhetoric. That the rhetoric of bellicosity that has surrounded, especially the initial phases of our intervention in the Middle East, these people aren't there. They aren't, I mean, you know, the, the Cheneys and the, the, the public face and the public uh, explainers of our presence. And, uh, too often they're hiding their kids away at Yale or, you know, or wherever, and they're, they're not putting their bodies where their rhetoric is. It's one thing to sit in a TV studio in your cute bow tie and say, let's go kill people. It's another thing to go and do it. And if you don't go, send your daughter or your son. They got to go. And they've got to not just go, they got to, you know, walk the streets and, and drive the, in the vehicles and risk maiming and death. And the hypocrisy of saying it's a great thing to go kill people, but somebody, you go do it. I'm not, and my kids aren't, but you go do it. After having gone through a war myself, I, I, that, that still stirs in me in the same way it did 40 years ago, uh, an anger that's hard to, it's hard to keep my voice under control as I'm talking about it now. Um, because it seems so dishonest and so cowardly and, and uh, so evil in the end. It is, in part that, in part to mimic all the, our collective memories, all of us, that um, memory is a strange thing that, well, if you think about it, how much of today do I remember? Well, I could, it's already abstracted, but I've already, of course, utterly obliterated almost every syllable to come out of my mouth. It's gone. It's history. What about yesterday? I can't remember every dish I washed, every scab I picked, every, you know, person I encountered. It's, it's every meal I ate. There are hundreds and thousands of them. And I would say that out of my life, 99%, probably a lot more than that, has been erased. That is, it's, I mean, obliterated erased. Can't remember a detail. Uh, and I'm not just talking about childhood. I'm talking about adulthood and people I've cared deeply about, and I remember them in loving ways, and yet have a few snapshots of memory. And we hold on to those, and we call them memory. And that's memory, that little... Uh, remnant of, of a lifetime, that's what's left to us. And we attach this word memory to it, which sounds, it has the sound of encompassing all, but it doesn't. And that certainly applies to the things they carried. I mean, it's a book partly about memory. The author of that book is an older guy, and he's looking back, and he's recycling event from different angles, sometimes inventing things as a way of seeking that which is, is, is gone. Uh, you, have, you have ghostly, I had a good friend, Chip Merricks, who uh, stepped on a landmine and was blown into this tree, and uh, he's been dead a long time. And yet, in the writing of the things they carried, I tried to in some way resurrect through imagination what his last thoughts may have been as he soared into that tree. The sunlight is killing me. 
I know I'm making it up, but I'm trying to sort of cast a, a light on that which has been darkened by, by uh, history and the passage of time to let Chip keep soaring. He, you know, he, so as long as that book is read, that guy's going to keep soaring into that hedge, for, you know, and into that tree. And as long as the book is read, little Linda at the end of the book is going to keep skating on that ice. And little Timmy will be in love with her and skating along. And that is, is what, you don't, you're not, I'm not saving their bodies and I'm not even saving the memories of these people really. But I'm saving something that you hope that's essential and enduring in the human spirit. The love of a little boy for a little girl and a good friend who soared into a tree in a terrible war. And that's something. It's not everything, but it's something. I'm mostly pissed off. I mean, I'm going to come down on that side of... There's a mythology that accompanies the memory of event. And by and large, for my fellow soldiers in Vietnam, the mythology is of betrayal. We were betrayed by our government. They didn't pursue it. We were betrayed by the liberal press. Uh, it wasn't our doing. It was their doing. In the same way that after World War I, the Germans were preached to by the forces of what became Hitler, that, you know, you were betrayed after the end of World War I. Germany was sold down. And by and large, my buddies feel that way that uh, we could have won the war if only there were more people weren't killed and more women raped and more houses burned. We would have won it. Uh, I, I don't think they're right, but they feel that way. I, don't, I think you could have paved the country with concrete and put up a big fence around it. I, you still have all these people who don't want you there. You're Americans and we're Vietnamese and this is our country and you may have the concrete and the bombs and the technology, but you're not going to win us win us. You may have won a war in a way. Well, that, there's, that, there's, so there's, I think there are mythologies of, of memory. And my dad carried with him out of World War II a mythology of America, the Lone Ranger and the doer of good and the, the carrier of the democratic flame. And uh, there was a kind of undercurrent of a, almost a soundtrack of you know Frank Sinatra, Gene Kelly soundtrack running beneath it of buoyancy and of, of virtue. And the soundtrack that ran beneath the movie of Vietnam, you know, you, you know, and all your people who are going to watch this know is not that I'll be seeing you sentimental journey soundtrack. It was a soundtrack of the doors and of the stones and it was an edgy and critical and and uh, much more ambiguous uh, soundtrack that more or less accurately reflected the ambiguities and the the uh, the, the absence of uh, certain moral underpinnings to that enterprise. That uh, so that th th those are two pretty different edifices of what's called the mythology about a war. And mythology is a way of eliminating all that doesn't fit into it. It doesn't, you sort of eliminate that part of it. I think there's probably some truth in the notion that there's an insidious and dangerous side to the mythology that surrounds Vietnam. It, it has a, a slight stink of the hip and of the cool and of the, uh, walking the dangerous line and the uh, I think there's a there, there was an exotic feel to the war in this far off jungle and that was part of the, myth, the mythology around it it sort of beckons beckons one anew to the adventure let me have my exotic experience and dangerous moment that uh, that manages to erase the absolute horror of it all and the the dead people and the dead children and just the horror um that may be part of what every writer about war has finally had to come to terms with in one way or another that the 
some pretty great books have been written, including the Iliad and the Odyssey, that haven't ended wars. They haven't ended the appetite for it, and probably won't, though you always hope. Um, I, this little son of mine who's now four, his name is Tad, and he, a week or two ago, he, he, I said I was going on a book tour, and he said, no, well, about what? And I explained the, what the things they carried was, and for the first time he had, he had encountered out of my mouth the word war in a personal way. That is, I'd probably heard me say it before. He said war, I mean, you mean really killing people? Like for real? And I said, yeah, for real. He said, really? I mean, really kill people? That, and I began by saying, you know, people getting in disagreements and trying to simplify it. But the astonishment on a four-year-old's face that people are killing one another. And he said, well, for, for what? And boy, that was hard to articulate an answer to it. I didn't have a, there, you know, there, I didn't have an answer. The answer I believe I had was, I don't know. I don't really know for what. Uh, I was, I was, though I'm a person who has thought about this stuff my entire adult life, I really haven't yet plumbed the for whatness of, of, of killing people. Um, and I don't, I don't think I ever will. Plummet. One of the huge things, of course, is there's no draft, and the people who are fighting are in the armed forces out of volition and their own will decisions, and that's pretty huge. It attracts a certain temperament that wasn't mine, that kind of can-do, macho, adventurous uh, temperament. And, of course, patriotism feeds in very strongly as well. Uh, that's, that's a pretty big difference from the people who went to fight. I mean, there were many volunteers, of course, who went to Vietnam, but there were, the bulk of us were draftees who probably more or less went reluctantly. And uh, in my case, a lot more than less. And so the two wars are being fought by American soldiers on each side that have pretty different temperaments. And I, for example, did an article uh, for a big magazine where I was sent to the Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio where the, the terrible uh, amputees are sent and the burn victims. And I felt great compassion for these young men and one young woman. But out of their mouths, there, 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 was, there was no none of the irony that accompanied the war for my, my generation. Uh, there was no questioning of the rectitude of the war whatsoever. It was just, it wasn't even thought about, as far as I could tell. I thought in response to my questions that, you know, do you ever wonder about there were no weapons of mass destruction. Did that bother you? And the answer was in uniformly from many, many miles, a flat no. It doesn't bother me. Don't even think about it. But even the don't think about it wasn't there. It was just no, it doesn't bother me. Um, there was none of the edgy feel of questioning or of ambiguity. It was that certainty thing we began with. It was there and those young people's, and these are horribly main people horribly wounded, but uh, instead coming out of their mouths were, were words such as wounded warrior and war against global terror. And there, it was kind of military sloganeering had, was part of their, who, who they were. And that, that was one, another one of the differences from my, from my time. One of the odd things, one of the, I guess one of the great ironies is that the things they carried as a book is one of the things being carried around Iraq and Afghanistan and finding out that book is passed around from soldier to soldier. And which gives me a little bit of hope that at least they're getting something from another point of view, and, which is mine. And that, that's, that's good for me. I don't know enough. Um, 
I'm, so, I'm such a simple-minded guy. I mean, I just assume that in most ways there's, there's no difference. Uh, the faces are younger and the bodies are leaner and because like the habits are better than in my generation. Nobody smokes anymore or very few. Not Everybody, they know about the right foods to eat. So everybody looks a little sleeker <laughs> than in my, my era. The girls look prettier and the guys look tougher. I mean, not tougher, but buffer. Um, but aside from that, I mean, I'm good. Like I can hang out with college kids or people in their 20s and feel utterly at home in, 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 in a way that I don't think I could have felt at home where I, 26, hanging out with some, you know, with Kurt Vonnegut, or I think I would have felt ill at ease. But there is a poise among young people that uh, really does astonish me, it really astonishes me that the way people can can uh, be, do something that was so difficult for me. So I'm not sure what to say exactly. I don't think I hate it. I fear it <laughs> more than anything. It's uh, because you're 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 put on the spot to art articulate things about something in progress that that have the danger of freezing you. That is, you say it enough times, I'm doing this, and then you damn well better do it. You start telling yourself, "Oh, I've said I'm going to write this book, and I, it's going to be that kind of book," and it freeze it freezes you where you, you're reluctant to go beyond it or push in another direction with the same book. Having said that, I, I, I know enough about what I'm working on to say that it's a book about being an older father. That I'm 63 and I got these two young kids and I can say that it's about the, some of the stuff that I was writing about with the, the things they carried, the, the sense of your own mortality it presses in on you in a war. You know, you know, you're, you know intellectually you're, you're going to die someday, but in a war you're reminded pretty often and it's, it's right at you. And I feel that way as an older father, I imagine. Where am I going to be 10 years from now? I mean, basketball is going to be tough. And will I even be alive? And um, the two little boys who are so, uh, know nothing of tombstones and uh, know nothing of the tick of biology are, you know, are facing it as I am. And uh, there's a sadness to it that's, has, is, that's accompanied by an exhilaration of the moments matter and by God I'm taking advantage of them, which is what I meant earlier about writing, that I'd rather, I mean, I could die tomorrow and I'd, as a writer, be content with four or five of the books I've written as being good. But I can't die and be content about these two unformed lives or aren't they're too young to be good and I want to try to be there to watch them become good and to do what I can to help and um, so I'm writing about that there, but it's funnier than that there are, fun, there are funny things in it too and the discovery of language and uh, the, 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 the storytelling part of the book is about the stories I tell these kids um, and their sources uh, partly in the world of now and partly in the world of long ago. What do I carry? I carry a lot of years that I feel that are, and it's, that's not all bad, it's partly bad. I, I carry a, what I think I probably, was probably come through in this talk we've had today is a, a kind of a delight in in doing what I do and a believer in doing what I do, along with a sadness about doing what I do. Um, because two decades later, I'm fielding many of the questions about war that I fielded all those years ago. And I'm saying, oh my God, you know, that's sort of back where we were. And then some, that that's, feels like a tangible burden. Um, but I carry with me these, two kids I mentioned, and even though they're not physically here, they're, they're all around me and the person I've become. And they're living inside me. And uh, I carry a slight uh, but palpable feel of, of obligation to uh, do justice to 
the savagery I witnessed and the senselessness of it and the the um the, the sadness of it and it it would it, so that sense of obligation is with me especially on occasions like this like this one where we're doing trying to talk lucidly about this stuff just to, to do justice to chip my buddy and to the ghosts of the the uh, dead vietnamese and dead americans and especially their mothers and dads who are still bearing the burden, even though their kids are long dead, I doubt they go to sleep many nights without some poor woman in Orlando remembering her her son of 40 years ago that she never got to ever hold again. And there, that's a, a pretty solemn, solemn obligation. Mm -hmm.